Nothing can work. The heart can't work, the brain can't work, the lungs can't work. Nothing can work effectively unless the kidneys regulate the intricate chemistry of the internal medium of the body. Prior to 1960, it was not even considered possible to treat patients who would not recover their kidney function. In other words, patients with chronic kidney disease were all doomed to death. When first invited to serve on the committee, I was very uncomfortable feeling that I was taking the place of God. Financially, we couldn't afford it. I supposed that I would just die, but I would trust God and pray that I wouldn't die. The doctor said that I had approximately two months to live. My strongest feeling is that this kind of a committee should not have to exist. This is going to cost and run into an awful lot of money, maybe billions of dollars. Uh, where are we going to get the money? That's what some of the taxpayers ask us. It's bad business in more ways than one to let people die. It's good business in plain dollars and cents to keep productive individuals alive today. Now, Scotty, will you cock the shutter? Yeah. And uh, stop down the lens? All right. You check meter reading? Yeah, we're all set. All, all set. Okay, that looks real good. Seattle, state of Washington, the largest city of the Pacific Northwest. Its proud landmark is the Space Needle, built for the World's Fair of 1961. Population of Seattle, one million. Over 50,000 of them work in the city's great aircraft factories. Seattle is also rich in timber. It has a thriving fishing fleet. The heart of the city is in the heart of Puget Sound. Thousands of its people commute to the business district every day on smooth, swift ferry boats. Most of them sail into metropolitan Seattle from the suburbs to work or shop. On this day, one of them, one of these thousands, comes to town for quite another purpose a unique and extraordinary purpose. His name is Duff, Donald Duff. He's one of 20 people in the Seattle area who come each week to this building on Columbia Street. Mr. Duff's calling days at Swedish Hospital are Monday and Thursday. He will arrive promptly at 4.45 p.m. He will be in bed five minutes later. And for the next 10 minutes, he is in the hands of a special medical staff. This piece of plastic and metal is a blood vessel, a man-made blood vessel, permanently attached to a vein and an artery in Mr. Duff's body. Twice a week it is detached, detached in such a way as to allow Mr. Duff's blood, all his blood, to flow out of his body
and into what is known as the artificial kidney. Mr. Duff suffers from what is known as chronic kidney failure. His kidneys have ceased to function. Those two organs of the body whose job is to remove waste matter from the blood have died inside him. No creature of flesh and blood can survive without properly functioning kidneys. Unless, like Mr. Duff, he's fortunate enough to have access to the artificial kidney. The artificial kidney is a washing machine. The unclean blood flows into it, is filtered through layers of cellophane, and washed in a solution called the dialysate. In this adjoining room, the dialysate is prepared for pumping into the artificial kidneys. Here at the Seattle Artificial Kidney Center, the machines can accommodate several patients at one session. They lie here through the night from 12 to 16 hours. Sleep will overtake them for a few of those hours, but sleep does not come easily to these patients. They cannot turn or toss while an arm or leg is attached to the machine. The supervision of the hospital staff must be constant. One of the patients is a young nuclear physicist. He works through the night. Others will read or watch television or talk themselves into drowsiness. Yeah, how's that new trailer working out? Oh boy, I, it's fine. It's, it's really the answer to our problem. So we were parked under some uh, big tall trees right by the Elwha River. The kids and I were out by the river, and I was teaching them to cast. We'd fished in the sound before. We'd never stream fished. And that was... Oh, and all night, while they read or talk or work or sleep, the entire blood content of each patient is being circulated through an artificial kidney and cleaned and pumped back into the body again. Through the night, this passage of blood from body to machine and back to body will be repeated 22 times. Mr. Duff, how did you first discover you had kidney disease? I had kidney disease for 10 or 11 years. And uh, about four years ago, I became real ill. Went to the family doctor, and he became quite worried. He sent me to a specialist, Dr. Brunel. Uh, I asked Dr. Brunel if uh, he examined me, and uh, he said I had glomerular nephritis. I asked him, what was that? I've never heard of that word before. Uh, Dr. Brunel said it was a fatal disease. I asked him what I could do for it. He said, there's nothing. But he says you're very fortunate to live in Seattle because they have here an artificial kidney. It could save your life. And were you immediately put on the machine? No, it's not that easy. You have to go through a screening process. As a matter of fact, you have to go through four different committees. The first one is the medical committee. It's composed of a group of doctors. These doctors are First step for screening all candidates for the kidney machine, the medical committee. These are doctors from the staffs of various Seattle hospitals. Their job is to decide whether the applicant is medically fit. That is to say that his life can be saved by the kidney machine, that he has no other ailments that might complicate his case. 
that aside from his kidney condition, he is otherwise physically fit. Also, mentally fit. The staff psychologist. By the time each case comes up for consideration, she will have visited the patient's home, will have interviewed all members of his family, will have made sure that the applicant is emotionally capable of living with this machine. For it takes great discipline to depend on a machine for your life. For the rest of your life. Because your entire life has changed. Uh, no more roughhousing with the kids. Your eating habits are all changed. Uh, you can't travel too far away from the city. You have to be near the center. After they find you have enough courage and stamina to stand up this machine, then, then you have to go before the finance committee. This treatment costs a lot of money. Money. The third step. The Artificial Kidney Center in Seattle has a special committee with a two-fold job. It will examine the applicant's ability to pay for the treatment. And if the applicant does not have enough money, then Earl Rice and Elizabeth Robinson of the Financial Committee will try to help him raise it. It costs $10,000 a year. More than that, each patient must guarantee payment for the first three years. $30,000 on the line. And that's a lot more money than I can make. But I've been pretty fortunate. My boss, Mr. Erickson, he's the president of the Carrington Company, told me when I knew I had to go on the machine that the company would back me up all they could financially. And uh, very fortunate for me, uh, the company has guaranteed my medical payments here at the center for the three-year period. Then you have to go before the admissions advisory committee. It's, these people are... Step number four, the last step in the screening process. The applicant must be approved by a jury of his peers. These are volunteers, anonymous volunteers, who will give the final yes or no to the applicant based on his medical report, his psychological report, his financial report, and on his record as a member of this community, on his record as a responsible human being. In a word, is he worth saving? For the cold, hard fact of the matter is, there are just so many places available on the kidney machine, and there are more applicants than places. Somebody has got to be left out, and somebody has got to decide who shall live and who shall die. We have spent considerable time discussing Mr. D. Each one of us has expressed his opinion, and while there have been some differences, I think that we are all of the same opinion at the present time. Does everyone agree? Agreed. Well, I think having <coughs> arrived at that point that we are then ready to cast a vote, and I'll call all in favor of accepting Mr. D. Say aye. 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 And opposed? Mr. D has accepted as the next candidate for our kidney center. Mr. Duff, when you filed your application for the kidney machine, were you the only applicant at the time? No, there were several of us. Were they all accepted? No, only two of us were accepted. You mean some of the others would turn down? Uh, two or three were rejected, I think. I don't know why, either for medical reasons or psychological reasons, or just didn't have the $30,000. Mr. Duff, what happened to those who had turned down? They're dead. I am a banker. I am a surgeon. I, uh, I am a lawyer. I am a physician. I am a labor leader. I am a housewife. I am a clergyman. 
The names, the faces of those who serve on this committee are never made known to those who apply for the places on the kidney machine. And those who apply are anonymous entities to this committee. The idea is to make each judgment impersonal and as impartial as humanly possible. When I was appointed to this uh, committee, I was really concerned as to how I would feel about making decisions which do involve life and death. I've had to deal firsthand with patients who were dying of kidney disease. And unless I could find a valid reason for declining the responsibility, I had to get over thinking that I was taking the place of God, but rather accepting a responsibility that God has placed upon us. I feel that in our economy, in our time, it just should not have to be that we should have to be deciding who could live and who can die when it's a mechanical thing, it's been proven, and it's just one of the things that I hope will end very soon. I can recall one meeting where we had four candidates. We only had one space. Uh, they were all terminal cases. Uh, but from the very fact that our decision was unanimous, I am sure that I slept better that night than I would have been otherwise. On this date, in this year, the committee has met to hand down its decision in the cases of three applicants. We have spent considerable time discussing the case of, uh, shall I curse, call him the milkman? His real name is Buddy Franklin. He lives and works in the town of Shelton, Washington. The town of Shelton is also known as Christmas Town, USA, because Shelton grows and sells more Christmas trees than any other community in the world. As one might expect from a town with such a leading industry, Shelton boasts more than the average share of community spirit. When Buddy Franklin came down with kidney disease, it turned out that he could meet every qualification for the kidney machine. But one, he could not afford $10,000 a year. And it was then that Shelton proved that its community spirit was more than an idle boast. The financial committee of Seattle's Artificial Kidney Center met with civic leaders and made certain suggestions. Eight times a day, radio announcer Sam Ebinger went on the air. Yeah, Shelton's a nice little town. Shelton's about to lose one of its nice guys. And there's no maybe about it. It's definite and it's irrevocable. He's not tired of Shelton or his family, and he does not want to take a job someplace else. He doesn't want to change the things he's known for most of his life, but he has no choice. He has only a fading hope. Buddy Franklin is going to die unless we, that's you and I, and everyone else in this town get behind a nice guy who just wants to go on living. Buddy's hope for a future, his family's hope for him, can be purchased. It's cold and it seems heartless, but money and a kidney machine are the only things that can now prevent his death. It's an expensive thing. For lack of money, in the midst of vigor, youth, and happiness, a man must face certain death. Our opinion is that we should not consider for a single moment the possibility of letting Buddy Franklin leave us. We can trade a relatively small amount of cash for a man's life. Buddy has no choice. I think we're in the same position. We have no choice. We can't let this man go. While well, the drive is underway, the Navy Mothers Club, the kids of the 1965 high school graduation class, the Island Lake gal staged a bake sale, and Tradewell and Job's daughters are having a pancake breakfast, and a Hillcrest boy and his eight-year-old buddy raised $50 collecting soda pop bottles and are cashing them in. So they pay off those little efforts, those small amounts, those acts that come from the heart. Anything, any effort, and any amount will help. Don't relax. We can't afford to lose this man, and his family can't afford to lose him, and he doesn't want to be lost. We won't get a second chance, but we can give Buddy Franklin a second chance. So send what you can to the Bucks for Buddy Fund, Sheldon Branch of the Seattle First National Bank. This is Sam Ebinger, KMAS Radio, in Sheldon. Well, it's really hard to put to words what they've done because they've uh, just went all out for me and a lot of them didn't even know me 
and they've, they've done everything they can to raise this money that I have to have. But I think the fact he contributes something as a, as a good person in a community, we want to keep that person alive. I would be for him. Well, I would uh, vote to accept him in, on the program because of his social study and also the medical progression sheet that he has. Uh, have we any other comments before this matter is put to a vote? We're down to it now. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Again, he has been, uh, our action has been unanimous. Buddy Franklin's life has been underwritten by his neighbors. He made the right choice when he picked his hometown. Not all the applicants for the machine have been that fortunate. Financially, we couldn't do it. I would probably just die or trust God that I wouldn't die. Case number two, Mrs. Phyllis Miller, 28 years old, housewife, mother of three. Sit down here. Medical diagnosis, complete kidney failure. Prognosis, if she's not put on the kidney machine, she could be dead within the year. Her husband, John Miller, has a gross income of $4,000 a year. When he was told it would cost $10,000 to keep his wife alive, he said, I don't make that kind of money, and I don't know anybody who does. The town of Vancouver, Washington, where the Millers live, is not Christmastown, USA. Thus far, in spite of the efforts and the urging of the Financial Committee of the Seattle Artificial Kidney Center, there's been very little effective action by the Vancouver community to raise the money that would keep Mrs. Miller alive. You ready, Jim? Okay, kids. Now, Daddy's going to take your picture. Now, run when I tell you three. One, two, three. Not so far, Laurie. Slow down. You will notice from our agenda that we did have one case listed. Case number three on the agenda this day, Norman Osier, ship designer, aged 43 father of three. Well, <clears throat> this is the sort of thing that you read about and you hear about, but you never expect <clears throat> that it would happen to you. Donald Duff gets his $10,000 a year from his employer. Buddy Franklin gets it from the people of his hometown. But Norman Osier poses a different kind of problem. He doesn't want his employer's money and he won't take what he calls charity from his neighbors. So he asked his wife to withdraw his application. I can't see how the government can justify the situation where they can let human beings just, just die for the need of, of medical help or medical attention. I, I, that's one thing I, in my own mind, I can't conceive of this country at this day in this age doing something like that. It just, uh, when they try to make themselves as humanitarians throughout the world and yet they won't take care of their own citizens, that I think it's disgraceful. Osier's contention is that he contracted his disease during the war when he served in the Navy, and therefore the money should come from his government. When Norm came out of the service, um, he wanted to further his education in his field. And I thought then that he should let the government help him since uh, he had served his country, but he said no, that he wanted to do it on his own. And then again, we had the opportunity to uh, draw on government resources when we built our home. And I kept kidding him about it all the time and asking him why we didn't do it, but he's a proud man and he felt that he should do it on his own. And he made the remark, and it seems so uncanny now. Maybe someday my government will have to help me. And I never thought that day would come, but it is. It's here now, and we just can't get that help. 
Well, no, I don't think that any group of people should sit in judgment of another person to decide whether they should live or die. I was advised by the director of the center just before we convened uh, this man had withdrawn his application and it will not be necessary for us to give consideration to it. I don't know what the reasons for his decision were. I just know that he has withdrawn his application. And a decision which I presume many persons have to make for themselves. In Holland, over 25 years ago, a young Dutch doctor developed the first practical specimen of a machine that might take the place of a kidney. The idea of the machine goes back a long time. The idea, that is. Dr. Willem Kolf, now a practicing physician in Cleveland. When I was the youngest volunteer, that means unpaid assistant, at the University of Groningen, which is in the north of the Netherlands, I had the responsibility for four patients. And one of these four patients was a young man, about 22 years old, and he had what is called chronic renal failure. And I couldn't help thinking that if it were possible to remove in some way or another enough of these retention products that were accumulating in his blood, that then this boy would probably be able to live a normal life. And I felt that all I had to do was make a machine that would circulate blood through a long tube of cellophane and remove urea and other retention products by dialysis. And this I started to do then in 1939. And shortly thereafter, the war came and the Germans invaded the Netherlands. And a Nazi was put at the head of the medical department of the University of Groningen. And the day that he came in, I went out. And I had to look for a place. And I found a place in a small hospital in the town of Kampen. And Kampen is situated where the river Eisel comes in the Zuider Zee. It was in 1943 that finally the first patient was treated with the artificial kidney. Now that first patient did not survive. And it was the 17th patient where I believe that probably, finally, we had a patient who owed her life on the dialysis. This woman was a person who was relieved from the prison in which her un our unreliable country men were at that time detained. And many of the Dutch would not have been sorry at all if she had died. But I believe very strongly that the first duty of a physician is towards the patient and if you expect that you can improve a patient, then it is your duty to do so. Kolf's original machine could keep a patient alive, but that patient would require a new operation, a new incision into veins and arteries for every dialysis treatment. Two operations a week, three. How long could any patient take that? For 15 years, doctors tried to solve the problem of how to gain permanent access to the bloodstream without repeated operations. It was not until 1960, on the campus of the University of Washington in Seattle, that the breakthrough was made. Dr. Belding Scribner of the faculty of the medical school of the University of Washington. In 1960, a group of engineers, surgeons, and physicians working at the University of Washington devised what we call uh, cannulas connected by a shunt with the idea that uh, we could possibly learn to maintain these cannulas and uh, plug the patient in again and again, thus opening the possibility of treating patients with chronic or irreversible kidney disease. 
I can show you best by using my daughter's technique for drawing a hand here. I'm not much of an artist. The cannula is worn either on the forearm or on the lower leg. And uh, there's a part under the skin that goes into the vessel like that. And then this part is outside. Two cannulas, one in the artery, one in the vein. And then so that the cannulas don't clot, we connect the high pressure artery with a low pressure vein so that the blood runs through very quickly at about a half a pint a minute. And the patient wears this at all times. And here is an actual cannula that is worn with a little clips. And uh, the patient uh, has this on his arm or leg. Then when it's time to use the artificial kidney, we simply take the shunt off and connect the blood lines that take the blood in and out of the artificial kidney where, it, where the toxins are removed. Well, our original patients here at the University of Washington are now in their sixth year. Dr. Scribner, how many people die of chronic kidney disease in this country every year? It's a very difficult figure to put your finger on because the, the statistics aren't available. I would guess they would number in the tens of thousands. How many of these chronic cases could be saved by the machine? Thousands of people could be saved were the treatment available. How many people are actually being treated on the kidney machine right now in the United States? I would guess uh, somewhere around 100 patients in the United States right now, perhaps 75 to 100. 75 to 100 are being treated? Thousands could be saved. Why the enormous divergence in those figures? The treatment is very expensive. In order to cope with this problem of the patients that are going to come, uh, we're going to need everything. We're going to have to start with building facilities, we're going to have to train people. We're going to have to do more research to get the cost down. And we're going to have to have a lead time. And back of all that, we need money. Lots of money. So much money, there's only one bank in the world that can afford it. And the doctors themselves have been applying to that bank for money. Well, Congressman Fogarty, this is a, a very unique ethical and moral problem, I think, and it's the first time in the history of medicine, to my knowledge, that it has occurred, where, as Dr. Saldus has indicated, there is an available treatment to keep people alive, people with a chronic disease, however, uh, and it's being denied to these people, as near as we can tell, solely because it's extremely costly. And uh, the question is, uh, should money be expended to do the most good for the most people, or do we dare to let a single human being die who need not die when there are available methods to keep him alive? Dr. Cass, why do some hospitals deny having this equipment? Uh, primarily because at present, uh, to handle a patient on chronic dialysis is averaging about $10,000 per year per patient. And the smaller the number of patients, the more it costs per patient, as you might imagine. Uh, who's going to pay the bill? What would it cost for this program? At the present going rates, it would cost $10,000 per patient. So this would be, uh, if we took the figure of 4,000, this would be $40 million the first year. And if these 4,000 stayed alive and we added 4,000 per year, I suppose over a 10-year period, uh, this would then increase to $400 million. This is going to cost and run into an awful lot of money, maybe billions of dollars. Uh, where are we going to get the money? That's what some of the taxpayers ask us. Well, I'd have to uh, reply to that question with one or two other questions of my own, perhaps. Uh, one is, uh, what is the worth and the price of a human life, or 4,000 human lives, or 40,000 human lives? And secondly, Congressman, to my recollection, that 400 million figure is not far from what an aircraft carrier costs, which becomes obsolete within a few years after it's built. It would obviously have to come from the government. This will be $400 million per year. $400 million dollars per year starting in 10 years, if all the patients stay alive each year. But hopefully, 
the cost would go down with advances in techniques, with new discoveries, and hopefully the number of patients on whom dialysis is, necessarily would go way, is necessary would go way down uh, with proper detection and prevention. Well, can't we do a better job in prevention so that we don't have that as a goal to look forward to 10 years from today? We can do a far better job with prevention. Knowledge of kidney disease is really not very widespread among the public or among the general medical population, in fact. This is quite in distinction to Europe, for example, where there's a field called nephrology, and this is a subspecialty. I don't know whether it's our puritanical background, whether urine's a dirty word in this country, or whether we don't talk about kidneys. Dr. Maxwell brought up the point of the work that can be done as far as industry is concerned. I serve on the Defense Appropriations Committee along with this Health Education and Welfare Committee, and we've gone at this on a project approach through the uh, use of contracts. Uh, we're spending billions of dollars to get to the moon, and it seems to me that these human problems, which we have right here on Earth, need to be solved. Uh, do you think the contract approach that we've used in defense and space would work here? I would strongly suggest that. To my knowledge, uh, this has not been used in medicine. And I should like to reiterate that I, I don't think, really, that the, the best engineering brains have been put to the task. There are huge industries involved right now in dialysis. That's desalinization of seawater. This is a worldwide problem. These engineers have thought of all sorts of problems of dialysis for the last 10 years and are heavily involved in it. And if they divert their attention to the human problem, it would seem to me that the construction of a completely new artificial kidney under new principles should be much more simple than the problems that they're facing in landing a man on the moon and getting men out into space. There is a way that has been developed to reduce the cost of dialysis. Install a machine in the patient's home. Teach the wife of the patient to assume the duties of doctor and nurse. Result? Home dialysis. Cost $5,000 a year. The home of William McHarg, one of the first patients to be put on the home dialysis program. The basement of his home has been converted into a private hospital. His wife, Carolyn, formerly a nurse, learned the intricate complications of dialysis treatment in a special course given at the University of Washington Hospital. Look out now. Don't hit, Don't hit him with it. Three nights a week, the rest of the McHarg family serves as her special staff. Research in home dialysis is directed towards simplifying the techniques and operation. Hope my blood flow is good tonight. Okay. While home dialysis does save lives, it places heavy burdens on the patient and on his family. Down there, okay. That one, Clint? Yeah, that's why it's so driven. Here we go. Oh, that's a good one tonight. I'm going to go out and start supper now, so the kids don't get too hungry. Hurry up, I'm hungry too. Okay. Mr. McHarg, how much of a change has this machine made in your life? Oh, I think I'm a, uh, almost a normal father, except I'm a dependent on a machine to, to stay alive. People have done remarkable work just to put me on this thing. And how do you thank someone for giving you back life? All right, kids, have a drink. Mm -hmm. 
No, if I wasn't here... I'd be left without a husband and three children to raise by myself. I can answer their questions, I can teach them, I can take them to movies or out and out and I go to work like any other father and support my family and I'm gonna put them through school. The home treatment program starts with a two-month training period within the hospital. That is, the patient and his family are moved to a special room in the hospital for training purposes. The individual caring for the sick patient is taught to draw blood, to take blood pressures, to administer medications, and to take care of the usual emergencies that might occur. Mrs. Louisa Morelli, housewife. When her husband was accepted on the machine, she took the two-month course. She had had no previous training in hospital techniques. I'll check out. That's oh, okay. I'll go over here and sit down for a while. If you need me, yell. Yeah. Okay, I'll call you later. Okay. I need you. I'll give you a buzz. I wouldn't trust anybody else but my wife on my machine. I tell you that she knows more about that and how to handle it and know what to do. And I think that as far as being a burden to her, uh, at home it's fine because she does not have to be with me every minute. In other words, she can go about her business, or cooking, or sewing, or ironing, or whatever she has to have done. She can do it because I can take care of almost anything on the machine as long as everything is running smoothly. If there's something that goes wrong, all I do is buzz her, and she can come down here, and we have to make some adjustments on the controls. She can make the adjustments. But uh, at, at home, I don't think it's near the burden it was for her as, as, being, as being at the hospital. How can a housewife overnight develop the skills of a highly trained nurse? The human hand and heart can do remarkable things when the life of a loved one is at stake. Dr. Cass has been brought to my attention at the American Medical Association that represents over 206,000 doctors in this country has refused to take a stand on the use of the artificial kidney, and uh, that is something I can understand as an organization uh, refusing to take a stand on uh, a life-saving device. Uh, what is your reaction to that? The problem is a very complex one, uh, and I can't go into all of the uh, problems uh, now, and even if I knew them all. We might anticipate a time when there are enough facilities for all who need it, but this is clearly far off in the future. Uh, what happens in the meantime? Who is selected and who is rejected? What are the criteria for selection? Do we allow people to remove themselves from the program? Uh, uh, in, in essence, do we allow a man to commit himself to die? Uh, uh, do we uh, 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 pay for all of this uh, out of public funds? Uh, to what degree does an individual have to pay for it out of his own pocket and his own capacity to pay? Uh, to what degree uh, is society uh, involved in the problem of paying the costs for keeping people alive who, uh, in essence, uh, were destined to die of, of this chronic disease? These are very serious social issues, and I think the AMA has felt that they were not enough resolved to take an official stand. Uh, Dr. Cass, do you consider the uh a dialysis, a research program, or a treatment program? Well, this is a very uh, important question, Congressman Laird. Uh, I would uh, consider dialysis now at the point in between. I think it's what I would call pilot plant or operational research program. Uh, I think we know enough about the fundamental problem of dialysis to say that it can be used, and it's been used with uh, obvious uh, uh, merit in, in uh, many instances. What I think we need now is a series of places that will utilize the technique as treatment, but they'll have to do it in a rather limited way while they train other people who are in a position to move out and set this up in other places. Do you agree with that? Dr. No. I'm sorry to say that my personal experience has been quite different. 
I believe that the chronic dialysis has gone beyond the actual experimental stage and it is now at the point where we can apply it to save lives. The kidney machine is no longer an experiment. It can no longer be classified as an experiment because it works. It is now a scientific fact, not a theory. It keeps people alive. The kidney transplant program is still in the experimental stage. The work in other fields, such as peritoneal dialysis, is still experimental. But the kidney machine works. People whose kidneys have ceased to function, who would ordinarily be doomed to death, they can live out their years on the kidney machine. Raising their children, taking care of their families. John Myers, oil executive. Three years on the artificial kidney machine. Mrs. Frances Wood, housewife. Ten months on the machine. Jen Yang, photographer, almost one year on the machine. Harvey Gentry, shoe salesman, five years on the machine. Clyde Shields, machinist, the first patient to receive the new cannula developed at the University of Washington. Shortly after he started his treatments on the machine, he was presented to a group of doctors at a medical convention. They gave him a year to live. Clyde Shields has been on the kidney machine and back at his job for six years. Kenneth Harpster was a construction worker, three years on the kidney machine. The Hippocratic Oath said that we will save every patient we can, and today we cannot do that. We have to select and say A will survive and B will die. That is not very easy for the doctor goes against his entire training because the doctor has been trained to save people. I'm not speaking out of statistics or theory. I'm speaking, so to speak, out of a very personal kind of experience. Three years ago, when I came down with kidney disease, I would have died had it not been for this machine. As it is, twice a week I go to the hospital. I am dialyzed and through this machine I have been given the opportunity to continue with my research and teaching. And who knows, some of the students here may become the doctors that will someday find the cure for this and other dreaded diseases. God knows it's not an easy adjustment to make. To live 32 hours of every week attached to a machine. But you live. And if you have the stamina for it, I mean the spiritual stamina as well as the physical, you can have your full share of life. I myself am only one of eight patients 
receiving this treatment in the entire Philadelphia area. It works. It keeps people alive. That is true and that is right. But there is also something wrong. What is wrong is that a medical miracle has been achieved and we refuse to face its implications. We continue to argue over where the money is coming from. And we have the money. Uh, we're spending billions of dollars to get to the moon, and it seems to me that these human problems which we have right here on Earth need to be solved. To my recollection, that 400 million figure is not far from what an aircraft carrier costs, which becomes obsolete within a few years after it's built. but we continued to argue the point. In the meantime, we confidently wait for other medical miracles, perhaps a cure for cancer. That could come tomorrow. But suppose it costs $10,000 a year, or 50,000. What would we do about that?